Hello everyone, my name is Rich and you are watching a live Hangout panel on air. Uh, this is hosted by Indie Plus. And, uh, Indie Plus, if you want to find out, uh, this adheres to the community standards of Indie Plus. And if you want to find out more about that, go to IndiePlus.org. Please be advised that uh, this event may include some explicit or abusive language. Probably not, but I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there just in case. Uh, we're going to be talking about romance and RPGs, so not necessarily romantic-related RPGs. Uh, but how can you take your regular D&D game and, and introduce the concept of some romance in there as well? So it's going to run the gamut of all tabletop RPGs. And I have a star-studded uh, panel here with us. So I'm going to start, and I'm only introducing them alphabetically because that's the only way I could order them. They're all so amazing. Um, so first, we have uh, we have <clears throat> Bill White. He's a game designer and communication scholar who studies role-playing games. The author of the Forge-inspired 2008 indie game Ganakagok, which I pronounced correctly, uh, and he's written adventures for Pelgrane Press and Evil Hat. How are you tonight, Bill? Doing very well. Nice to be here. Thanks, Rich. Great, great, great. Next we have uh, John Wick. He's the game designer of, okay, seriously, Legend of the Five Rings, Blood and Honor, Wield, uh, let's see, uh, Little Dragons, My Monster, uh, there's like the Book of Little Games. I, can't, I could go on and on. John is a, is a, a prolific game designer, and I'm excited. But not a very good one. <laughs> That's up to those who pay me. Uh, and then next we have Liz. She GMs and plays far too many role-playing games. She's an avid blogger, the co-founder of Angry Hamster Publishing, and they're launching their first Kickstarter for Witch on the 1st of March. So that's tomorrow, right, Liz? Uh, yes, it is tomorrow. Actually, for me, it's today because it's 3 a.m. in the morning here in Holland. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry you had to stay up so late, but hey... Everybody, when you watch this, you're watching After the Fact, go check out Witch on Kickstarter. I'm sure that you can just search Witch, and there will probably be like 60 entries, but look for the one that just started. Uh, and then last but not least, we have uh, Misha. Misha is a veteran player and occasional game master. She's a mom of two mini-gamers and could always use a little more romance in her life. Aw, Misha. <laughs> anyway, how are you, Misha? Good. She's good. Doing good. Great, great, great. Uh, so here it is in February, the last day of February. But hey, February's got Valentine's Day, where we go buy cards and uh, and 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 flowers and other things for our loved ones. So why not again, talk about romance? Now, I thought it'd be cool if we led off with each of the panelists, just giving a brief summary of either a cool romantic actual play moment that you've had, or what you look for in romance in RPGs. So Misha, I'll just stick with you. Do you want to share with us? Um, so I think what I look for uh, with romance in an RPG is the same thing I look for in romance in real life. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the grand, dramatic, you know, six dozen roses delivered to your house on Valentine's Day. It could be just, you know, oh, you know, I, I saw these flowers and I picked them for you and I thought you would like them and, and I brought them to you. And so uh, so we, we've had some pretty cool, you know, um, player-type moments between characters uh, that are just on that small scale, you know, just little touches, you know, hey, I thought I saw this, I thought it would make you happy, so I brought it to you, you know, kind of things. Sometimes it's an orchid, sometimes it's a flower. It, it depends on the, uh, the, the player. <laughs> Damn, why did you have to go with orcas? Come on, Misha. Only because you said orc and it was stuck in my head now, and, and I couldn't help it. <laughs> cobalt head, would that be better? Um... Orcs are misunderstood. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, so Lynn, uh, over in Holland, oh my goodness, how, how are you? Please share with us some of your, uh, your romance story. Um, I think my favorite moment was um, we were playing in a Vampire the Masquerade game and um, one of our players who had this really intense romance with a demon basically, he, he had left and then um, she had found another lover and they were living together. This guy was actually like a really nice guy, you know, the kind of guy that you build your life with. And it was at the point where the demonic lover, you know, the kind of badass guy was coming back. And it was like this really intense scene between the three of them where she had to decide which one she wanted to be with. And of course she chose the badass guy. 
and the entire room, like it was silent for like five beats, and then the entire room of players just exploded. And it was hilarious because my husband was like, how could you do that? How could you do that? Quinn's such a nice guy. I'll take away and it's fine. And everyone's just like, no, no, this can't happen. And th that, that made me really happy because just everyone was so, and I and like my, the player who chose as well, she was just sitting there giggling like, so that was a really nice moment that we had in game. Oh, uh, that is fantastic. Uh, so, John, share with us. So, uh, what about uh, romance and RPGs? What what does it for you? What do you enjoy? Um, the very first RPG that I designed, uh, Legend of the Five Rings. One of the huge things in it was romance, um, because when you do samurai, you have one of the things that one of the things you can address is the the problem of duty versus love and and uh, one of the huge things that we did one of the most controversial controversial things we did in L5R um, which I actually had to fight for was that uh, female samurai samurai ko uh, had to be unmarried because the the and and that was a, that was an exception um, male samurai could be married but female samurai could not because women weren't expect because a woman was expected to be uh, loyal to both her husband and the daimyo, and that was just too blurry for the Rokugani people. And I, I had written that in the original draft of the RPG, and when I got notes back from uh, Ryan Dancy and John Zinzer and things, and they're like, "This is completely sexist," and I said, "Yes, it is. It's completely sexist, no doubt." And they said, "Well, why are we including this in the game then?" And I said. Because it's completely sexist. It, it, it is a problem that people have to deal with in the culture. If you make the culture absolutely perfect, there is no conflict. You get Star Trek, where you have to go to other galaxies to find conflict because everything over here is just perfect. And by the way, uh, you know, uh, nice words about, about uh, Mr. Spock, about Leonard. Um, but... That was that was the big key for me for romance in Rokugan, was that it was forbidden, because if you just make romance forbidden for women, that means it's also forbidden for men, even though it's not explicit in the rules. So by making romance this thing that was completely illegal that everyone was doing anyway, made it interesting and made it a plot point. And because it's a plot point and because it's it's like conflict within the game, there's rules for it. Uh, it meant that players were interested in it, and that meant that with players being interested in it, you could you could the game master could put it in stories and make it interesting. Wow, that's awesome! Thank you, John and Bill. What what about you? Some romance stories from from your table? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, it turns out that uh, um, because relationships are so important in um, Ganakagak, this uh, game that I wrote. Uh, in which uh, players are uh, player characters are essentially members of a tribe of people who are fighting for their survival. Uh, but because relationships are so important in that game, um, you get a lot of romance, and you got a, you get a lot of what turns out to be um, uh, bedroom farce kinds of stories. And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, recent games was um, this. Uh, uh, player was playing a, a young man who was trying to woo uh, a young woman, you know, an NPC. Um, and, you know, by creating a, um, you had to go out and create, you know, the uh, a uh, uh, like sort of a honeymoon lodge, right, sort of thing. You know, sort of had to create a space, a boudoir of, of sorts to to um, uh, to uh, woo uh, this young woman, and she had to, uh, uh, the NPC character had to uh, stock it or, or you know, uh, spruce it up, make it nice, and so that together that would be a symbol of their bond, right, their connection between each other. Um, and uh, so the player was doing that, and then another player um, playing his mom decided that the, um, the, the girl was clearly just not doing a good enough job, so in order for her son to be happy, she had to come and um, get involved in their, um, their bedroom uh, uh, their boudoir thing, and and uh, so it became this sort of farcical, um, mom, mom, get away, mom, and um, uh, uh, that was that was actually kind of kind of fun, and uh, and there are other uh, stories uh, 
like that. But I, I think that, that John's point about uh, relationships being conflict or romance being a source of conflict is actually um, kind of gets right to the point of how you incorporate romance into role-playing games, right? That it's about it's about how does the relationship or the promise of a relationship or the, um, the dissolution of the relationship become fodder for conflict that other uh, people can get, um, get involved in. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so we're about to hit some questions that... Uh, now, if you follow Indie Plus on Google+, Plus, you had a chance um, ahead of this panel to ask some questions. However, we do have Q&A on right now. So if you're watching live and we haven't hit the question you're burning to know, feel free to jump in and ask a question. But we have some questions that we got ahead of time. Um, now, I'm going to start off with what kind of called the third wheel problem. And Liz, I'm going to start off with you. Eric Duncan and Jason Blaylock both ask pretty similar questions. We kind of bundle them together. How do you keep the other participants not involved in the game, engaged? You talked about that in your outset. You know, how do you keep everybody else who's not involved in the romance as an audience? Or do you just find other ways to involve them as participants? Um, well, I think there's, it's kind of a two-parted um, two answer to that. Uh, first of all, I find it very important as a DM for each player to have something a little bit special about their own personal storyline going on. Um, I think that's important to focus on just because even if you're playing something that maybe isn't really focused around um, players and their lives, it just keeps people engaged. So if someone wants to have a romance and that's what they want to focus on, that's fine. Um, so obviously if each player has that one special thing um, in their lives, then they're much more willing and happy to, you know, look at what everyone else is doing and listen in and say, like, ooh, how, that, how is that going to turn out? Um, but also I think it's important, um, at least uh, in, in longer-term games that you're playing, and even in short ones, that everyone has a connection to each other. Um, I often play in really long campaigns, and so, you know, everyone's pretty invested in each other's lives. You know, you're friends, and you want to see things work out well for the other person. Um, or sometimes you just watch a train wreck happening. It's like, you know, you're that person shouting at the TV, like, don't do it, don't do it. Um, so I think even if, if you're playing a very short game, that's also something to keep in mind for yourself. Just, you know, think how are these, um, how are these characters connected? Like, you know, why, why is um, Liz going to care about Misha's romance? How does Liz feel about Misha? I mean, maybe also me and Misha's character don't like each other, so I'm sitting there twirling my mustache waiting for it all to end in flames, you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think I think the key is just making sure that people have connections to each other, and also um, making sure that everyone has something special to hold on to, and that always makes you uh, happy to listen to other people's stuff. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Misha, what about you? Any other advice you would have about uh, keeping other participants engaged? Um, so I mean, most of it comes down to you know when you're. Pa passing the spotlight. So, you know, make sure that you're not focusing too much on the player or players having the uh, the the, uh, the interaction. Um, you know, if it's a player NPC, you know, make sure that, you know, okay, well, we're, we're going to cover this and we're going to spend about five minutes, ten minutes on this, but then we're going to pan over and we're going to cover, you know, Bob's, uh, you know, interpersonal thing over here. But also with, uh, with what piggybacking on what Liz was saying, you know, some of it is, you know, making sure it's involved. So, like, uh, I was in a Monster Hearts campaign, you know, um, it was one of my, it was my two best friends were going at each other, and they're horrible for each other, but so they were both coming to me, it's like trying to get advice on what they should do so they could keep their romance going, and so some of it is just, you know, pulling in other players, it's like, okay, you know, hey, I'm seeing this guy, but he's horrible for me, or I've seen this girl, and she's great, you know, and so involve not just the the romance shouldn't be just between the two players you know it, just like you would talk about it in your personal life in, in your normal life you know hey you know I'm seeing this guy you know hey would you like to you know we're gonna go get dinner you want to come join me I think you should meet them um, just try to keep everything keep other, the other players involved both in the game um, so you know I, I'm guessing most of the times if you're playing the characters are, are you know at least friendly if not friends um, most of the time, you don't play with other characters that are directly antagonistic to you. Usually, most of the time, so you know, just treat the treat the the player friendships the way you would your real friendships. Cool, I like that. It's good, John. Um, what what do you have to add about keeping the other participants engaged when a romance story is ongoing? Um, I think 
I think uh, the, the, the ladies really covered it really well. Um, from my point of view, from my own personal GMing style, it's, hey, this isn't your turn. This is somebody else's turn. Be patient. It's going to be your turn. Um, you know, and if and if you can't deal with that, hey, there's the door. But then I'm the guy who wrote play dirty, so you know. Uh, but seriously, no, I, I, I ever since I, I I heard the term, I mean, I think it's something that you know, as game masters, we've been doing for a very very long time. But ever since I heard the term spotlight, I was like, oh, great! Now I can like use this term that I for this technique I've been doing for all this time. Um, and the idea is like, hey, look, this is this is this player's spotlight. You know, be polite. You know, be cool. You know, it's it's you know, th- and and I I tend to re- I I'm I'm a Pavlovian, so I tend to reward people for being good and punishing them for being bad. So you know, when people not only uh, you know honor the spotlight and and you know sit back and be quiet, but not only that, but pay attention. And and I encourage when I run games. I encourage people to make background sounds. I encourage people to to um, take part in the scene in different ways. If they're walking down, ooh, romance. Um, when I uh, uh, so when they're walking down the street, you know, there's players in the background with mobile voices, you know, doing the voices of the people they pass. And you know, and and people are you know, and and maybe there's a car alarm, and you know, and all these other things, and, and to participate in ways to add to the scene, and you know, and that's true for any kind of scene, but you know, I mean, and that's that's one of the things that I encourage people to do is is not just watch the scene, but participate it, in it participate in it in subtle ways, and I usually use game mechanics that allow people to interject. And say I'm spending a point. I would like to make a suggestion for this scene, and that way, players are almost always paying attention to what's going on, because they like doing that. They like spending a plot point and saying, "Hey, uh, isn't it true that uh, that 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 uh, um, uh, that your mom is really really sick and you have to go to the hospital?" I'm like, yes, it is true that my mom is really really sick. We need to go to the hospital, or you know, even less mundane thing, or you know, more exciting things than that. But uh, and those are the ways that I keep people involved in just about any scene. But in romance scenes, yeah, it's it's really about it's spotlight. Nice. And now I'm going to eat Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> Bill, what about you? Anything to add there? Yeah, just uh, real quick. Uh, I mean, I think it has been covered. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of what I would have said has been covered. But what's interesting about that question is that it assumes right that romance plot lines are different somehow from. Other kinds of stories, right? That in other sorts of, in other sorts of, play, that everyone is engaged. You know, everyone is already simultaneously uh, participating. Um, but that, but that romance somehow breaks that or does something different, and it really doesn't, right? I mean, as as some of uh, what uh, John and and Liz and Mish have been saying, you know, sort of sort of emphasizes. Uh, you're doing the same things in this kind of play where what's at stake is what happens in a relationship or to a relationship, uh, whether romantic or whatever, and other kinds of conflict, other kinds of events. I mean, you know, in a melee round <laughs> in D&D, you're going around and uh, shifting the spotlight and things like that. And so the same techniques that you use to make play go faster, engage players and other players' turns, um, make what's at stake for one player, that is the player involved in a romance or in a relationship, um, uh, what's at stake for that player is also at stake for other players, that is other characters care about what's going on, either because, you know, the object of his affection is the object of the rival's affection, right? And there are ways of, uh, there are ways of setting up situations and influencing player play so that uh, those things are true. Um, so that, that's just a, a quick... Um, uh, uh, um, emphasis of what has already been said. Cool. Thanks, Bill. Uh, now I'm going to stick with you. We're going to kind of move into our what I call the tainted love section of questions that we got. Uh, Eric Duncan asked, what pitfalls should you watch for when presenting um, queer, kinky, or poly romances within the, the game? Uh, you know, I'm honestly not really sure, right? I mean, I think that the uh, thing that you should be... Um, 
uh, uh, most aware of is uh, stigmatizing it or treating it as something different than any other kind of romance. I, um, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with with that. Um, and uh, like, I do remember, like in a game of Ganakagak, um, I, I remember reflecting back on something that I had said to a player who was playing a queer character about his grandmother, like maybe rejecting him or her, and and I should have thought. You know, oh gee, you know, maybe that's not culturally what would be expected. I mean, I was trying to—I was trying to introduce conflict. I was trying to introduce something into, you know, to drive that player a little bit. But I sort of automatically made that assumption that, you know, oh, that would be frowned upon. And reflecting back on, it, I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have made that assumption. And so, so that's. Um, but without a lot, without much more experience than that, in in having that kind of um, uh, that kind of romance in play. Um, I'm not sure, so I'll just turn it over to the other panelists. Cool. Uh, Liz, are you interested in uh, jumping in? Um, I mean, sure. I think um, I think when you're always talking about someone, something other than yourself, you know, like if you're straight and you are, you have a queer relationship or anything like that, that you should always be respectful and remember that you, you should treat people like people. That's always what I say. Um, when you're creating a character that, you know, you make a realistic character no matter who or what they are. Um, so I, I think that's very important to, um, very important to remember and just that you're not playing a caricature. But so far with the people I've played, everyone's always been res um, respectful. Um, we've had someone who has played a gay character before, um, a female who played a gay male. But, um, yeah, it, it really, it kind of was a non-issue. Um, Basically, that was just her preference, um, or his preference. I'm sorry, um, and, and you know, you know, that's it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, if you're gay, you're gay. That's that's fine for you. And you know, so he hit on guys, and everyone was like, okay. Um, I can understand that maybe it's uh, it's more difficult for some people um, if you have people at the table who don't accept things like that or something like that. But I think you you should be very clear about the type of game you're running. Um, and, and just say, like, listen, I'm fine with this, so if you're not, then maybe this isn't the game for you, unfortunately. And, uh, cool. yeah. Cool. Thank you, Liz. Uh, John, did you want to talk about uh, uh, kinky, poly, or, or queer romance in, in games? Uh, I was actually personally... Uh, I mean, I was accepting but uncomfortable about all of those topics until about six years ago when I moved to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, when it kind of got thrown into my face. Um, like I said, I was very accepting of it. I, you know, I, I had, I've had gay friends before I moved to, to Phoenix, and I had my uncle, one of my uncles uh, was, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but was, was gay. And uh, was my kind of waking up to that whole notion of, of what gay was and, and, and you know, and that. Because I had, I'm a nice boy from Minnesota. I had no idea what any of that stuff was until my, my mom's Uncle Frank, who's always been my Uncle Frank, came out, and, and I was like, what does this mean? And me being me, I went to the library, right? Because that's all I had, but, uh, and talking to him. Uh, so a lot of those things were, were uncomfortable for me, but, but at the same time, I was, it was just because they were very different. I was introduced to my first uh, 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 trans friend uh, a few years ago, and I was incredibly uncomfortable. I, I, I had no idea how to react. I had no idea what questions to ask. I had no idea how to even address this person. I, I mean, how, how, what do I do? And it wasn't until I said that out loud and said, I have a, I'm really uncomfortable and I don't know how to act. So please forgive me. I don't know how to act. Please, please teach me here because I want to be respectful of you and, and all of that other things. And, uh, and that was a really neat conversation for me. And I think what I'm trying to get to is the idea that all of these topics can be incredibly uncomfortable for people because in our culture, they're, they are presented as the other and weird and strange and not us and all that. And it's by, um, it was because I knew my, my Uncle Frank that I became okay and not uncomfortable talking to, to a homosexual man. And having characters in, in the game who are not, you know, who, who, you know, have a widespread of gender orientation, you know, all that other stuff, um, is a great way to get over that, you know. If, if that is something that you want to do, you know. On the other hand, uh, 
uh, <laughs> on the other hand, the uh, the other sense of that is that when I play in most role-playing games, I am incredibly, as a person, I'm incredibly uncomfortable with violence. Uh, I, I watch professional wrestling because I know it's not real. You know, I mean, that's that's pretty much the only combat sport I can watch because it's not real. Um, and so when, when uh, one of the ways I get over that is that I, whenever the players enter into, or I'm in the game and I enter into really violent conflict, I describe the violence in as vivid, bloody, gory detail as possible and try to show people how uncomfortable I am with this. Um, uh, so... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm paying attention to the chat, and I shouldn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that part of the question is is that how do you deal with this when it's uncomfortable for you? Well, the, the, the part of the problem with that question is why is it uncomfortable for you? And it's not because you're wrong, and it's not because you're bad, and it's not because, you know, anything like that. It's because, you know, you're uncomfortable with it. You're unfamiliar with it. You don't know what to do. You don't know, you don't know the rules. You don't know how to address things. And I think that that is part of the way to really address the, the, the real core of the question, which is, you know, why do we feel uncomfortable about these things? And why don't we allow them in stories? You know? And, and I think, anyway, that's what i got to say about it. Right. I, I, um, I think that's a really good point, right? And I think that, you know, we've sort of been talking around the issue of, well, why should we be asking this question at all, right? I mean, um, you know, it... it Either uh, and there are other questions that have sort of been posed to us about people being uncomfortable with the idea of romance in general, right? I mean, and that's that's fine, um, but the notion that there's a particular kind of of love or or or, or uh, attraction or relationship that should make us particularly uncomfortable is maybe something that we should um, um, uh, question, right? That we should question that, you know, that that is a question. I'm reminded of. Um, I guess it's one of um, Jonathan Walton's Dungeon World supplements where um, you can create characters who are um, a mixed race, mixed species, for lack of a better a back of better term. And uh, uh, jo Jonathan writes something like, you know, uh, where to, where love exists, uh, um, uh, you know, how uh, uh, love will find a way, love and magic will find a way. And so if you want to have your half dragon, half, um, half kobold, um, uh, a player character, you can have it, right? You can have that character. And so I think maybe that's the approach which we should take. I don't know. And at the other, t t at the same time, you know, you're, you guys are telling a story together. So, you know, push it back on, on to the other players. Like, okay, you know, we're, we've made this world. How how are queer romances treated? You know, is is this something that's taboo? Is this something that's totally normal? You know, just not a big thing. Is poly the standard? Is is you know is monogamy just weird? You know, so that's something that you as players have to decide as well. You know, how are we going to tell these stories? You know, is this going to be something that's going to be an issue? Is this something that's just been, yeah okay, they're together, what keep going. Um, or, or is it going to be something that isn't? Something that you, you actually, you know, you know if, if they're walking down the street hand in hand, are people going to turn and gasp and, you know, oh my god, we have to clutch our pearls now. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's a two-way street. You know, yes, you, you as a player might be uncomfortable with it, but yeah, you, yes, you have to examine why, but at the same time, okay, what do we think the world... Is the world that we're playing in uncomfortable with it? Or is the world that we're playing in not uncomfortable with it? And and some of that is, is something that you have to decide. So, you know, back to what Liz says, you know, be definitely, first thing, be respectful. Um, but, you know, these are actual people's stories that you're, that you're telling. You know, somebody out there is going to have this as a background. Um, so, you know, don't make it a trope. Don't make it... Um, you know, don't always play, oh, this is the, you know, the, the trans uh, woman who is completely over-sexualized, Dr. Frankenfurter-style, you know, uh, trope. You know, it, it's not something, it, it, you know, come on, you can tell a better story than that, dude. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my take on it. You know, just agree. You might have to take that conversation out of character. You know, it's like, okay, how does the world treat this? Okay, now I know how to deal with it in character, too. 
That's excellent. I really appreciate that, Misha. That's great. John, did you have anything? I think you had a comment to add. Yeah, I just want to really quick uh, say that what Misha just said is fantastic. And uh, also that uh, when I was uh, designing uh, a certain... Well, I, it was Legend of the Five Rings. When I was designing Legend of the Five Rings, it was absolutely verboten that any mention of homosexual samurai be in the game. Even though that was a huge part of samurai culture. I wrote a bit, I wrote a sidebar about um, romantic love between male samurai. <clears throat> and that was excised quickly. Gone! Now, to be fair, uh, I had a, 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 an adventure about a pregnant ghost, who a woman who had j died in childbirth, and so she wandered around the mountain with her baby in, in the throes and pains of, of labor, and that was was not excised because only because uh, the guy who excised the last bit didn't read it and missed it. But when it came out, he got very mad at me, and I got a talking to. But uh, yeah, sex is uh, sex is a really touchy subject for some people, in, and in general, just in America, let alone just gaming. So it's something that that I think should be respected, but at the same time, you know, should be approached. Honestly, it's like, why is there a problem with this? So. Fair enough. Uh, Misha, I'm going to jump back to you. Eric uh, had another question, uh, which is, how do you handle uh, kind of the conversation with players ahead of time about some of the related issues to romance, displays of affection, sex, birth control? Um, how, how would you recommend handling? Um, I have a, a, a theory in parenting that I kind of bring to, to the gaming, too. It's um, uh, two yes, one no. So if any player at the table is uncomfortable with it, we don't do it. Um, but if everybody's comfortable with it, cool, we keep going. Um, so, you know, some of the things, yeah, we'll have to bring up out of characters. Like, okay, you know, you know, it, it, we're talking to... Um, most of the time, it, it kind of... Most of the game players I play with, I've known well enough that we kind of know each other's sticking points now. Um, but when we're, we're, like, in, if you're in a con game, it's like, you know, oh, okay, you know, I, um, we were in one recently, um, and uh, the question came up with, um, so, you know, do you, do you persuade this person? And it was like, you know, you know do you have roofies? And that's where you're like, no, we, we, we're, we're not even going to go there. And, and so some of it is, yeah, you know, you might use, you know, um, if you're playing a con game or, or with a group that you're not f familiar with some of the sticking points and you're not necessarily comfortable talking about it um, ahead of time. Uh, so, yeah, a tool like, you know, an X card or just, you know, a straight cut and break, you know, no, we're not going to go there. You know, it, dude, that's not cool. Um, uh, it, as you're playing is fine. Um, but for the most part, just, you know, you know hey, we're going to be uh, these, you know, my character wants to have sex. I don't know how far you guys want me to describe it, so just stop me when I get too graphic kind of thing. Uh, works pretty well for, for, for our group. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I go. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Misha. Uh, and by the way, uh, Misha mentioned something called the X card. We'll we'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I I feel like we we X card a lot on a lot of the panels, so probably people have heard of it. But if you have it, we'll have a link to the pretty succinct description of that. Um, John Stavropoulos is the person who I first heard of it from, and uh, he does a great job explaining. So I think I'll find that old Google Plus post where he talked about it. If not, I know there are a couple other sources. Uh, Bill, do you want to tackle this one? Sure. I mean, I think that. Um, you know, you use the phrase lines and veils, and, and of course, you can have that conversation, or you can tackle things as they emerge in play. And I think that just being aware uh, and, and, and sensitive to uh, the kinds of things that, that players might want to uh, uh, drop a veil over or draw a line around is, is important. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of, I was running a Romance in the Air uh, last weekend at Dreamation, and it was, it was a great game. This is my, this is my fate core adventure. Um, it's sort of like a steampunk romance and political intrigue in a Europe that never was. And uh, the characters, uh, character I'm thinking of was uh, uh, sort of, uh, she was a bride on her honeymoon. And um, the, her, her husband was an NPC, a uh, very important political figure, and most of the play revolved around other player characters trying to essentially break up the marriage, right? So it was very important. 
that um, that that you know this this princess wanted her happy ending and she was fighting for that happy ending all through all through the adventure. And so naturally, if she uh, she ha um, became pregnant with an heir, right? It would that would be an important political thing. And so at one point at one point the player asked me, "Oh, can I roll to get pregnant?" Right? And um, uh, that was I'd never had a player ask me that before, um, but it made sense, and and uh, and so she rolled, and I, I so I set the difficulty in particular level, right? Okay, you roll roll this, and you're pregnant. That's fine, and you can roll every so often. And um, uh, uh, at you know at one point she rolled, and I said, oh, I bet the doctor, right, who was another player character who was secretly in love with her, could could um, you know could somehow help, right? You know somehow help. And and she stopped me. The player stopped me. He said, well. And and it's great because it's Victorian when she said that's indelicate and and stopped uh, and stopped any further conversation about that particular thing. So that that was clearly a, a lines and veils moment, right, where the player um, uh, sort of uh, decided that you know we didn't didn't need to know the details. We just need to know that the effort um, uh, had been made. So um, uh, that is. Uh, uh, so, so that's just an example of what I mean when I say tackle that stuff as it emerges. Uh, be listening for, and and you know, be listening for player demural when you 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 push for something and someone says no, uh, let's draw a line around. Thanks, Bill. Liz, uh, do, you, do you have some some uh, some things to add about the idea of a kind of social contract with the group? You know, how far romance is going to happen? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you should talk, I think everyone, everyone said this already, you know, talk to people about how, um, how and what type of game they want to play. I think that's, that's always very important. Um, but, uh, yeah, I also, I also think that, um, yeah, knowing your players and then also addressing it when it comes up, you know, um, we, we always seem to very, like in role play games, I find everyone's always really fine with violence. You know, we're always fine with like murdering like hordes and hordes of cobbles, but like the moment two people fall in love, you're like, what do we do? How do we react to this? You know, <laughs> it's a bit of an icky subject. So obviously, I mean, if, if you have a player, uh, you have players who are new to romance, um, it, it's good just to just to quickly stop, almost like kind of at the seed of the idea, and say, hey guys, like, are you okay with this? You know, does anyone have anything that they don't want to see? Um, and uh, yeah, they just move on from there. And obviously, I think I think you know, do it tasteful. That's just my personal uh, <laughs> that's my personal opinion on it. You know, give 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 a love story. You know, something that I think a lot of us prize very deeply in our normal lives. Give it the respect it deserves. Thank you, Liz. I really appreciate that. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of stick with you. We have a question here that I like from Alden Strock. Uh, what are the best ways to check in with your fellow players that the romantic storyline is going in an entertaining direction and not veering toward the uncomfortable? I know Misha's already kind of touched on that, but do you have any, any tips or tricks on how to, to check in with groups? Especially, it seems like con games seem to be the most... I don't know why you guys even do romance in con games. You're crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. You got a lot of faith in people, but hey, you make it work. Liz, how would you make it work? Um, I think uh, John mentioned this a bit earlier that you know every person should have their spotlight, but and so and just just to take that a bit further, and if we're taking it in a con situation, you know, make sure that everyone's getting their turn. Um, and if someone wants to do incredibly boring, I mean, I've also seen people who want to go shopping for an entire role play session, and you just say, oh, okay. If you want to go shopping, you can go shopping. Um, but uh, and I think it's the same thing with the romantic storyline as well. And also, it's a good it's a good check as a DM. I always find the more people doodling, the more you know that the plot line is not interesting. People <laughs> like doodling is a telltale sign um, that something is going the wrong way. Or you know, if you have people shifting, or I'm going to go get a drink. And also, if there's a lot of crosstalk, the crosstalk too often, unless people are talking about the storyline, is normally a a red, uh, a red flag that maybe you should switch to somebody else quickly because people are just not having it. That's really great, Liz. There's some good reading the table. Really good idea. Yeah. The doodle curse. <laughs> yeah, or the, the cell phone, you know. Yeah. 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 Uh, Misha, do you, you already kind of brushed it. Anything else you have to add about checking in with people or ways uh, to make sure everybody's not 
I mean, you know, everybody's comfortable with where you're headed. Um. Yeah, I mean, just echoing what Liz says, you know, uh, you know, are are people, you know, paying attention? You know, are are they sitting there doing this, or are they, you know, uh, are are they, you know, going, you know, like you, you can have a really compelling storyline going on, and people are like super glued into it. But at the same time, you know, if the, if they're, you know, sitting back or checking their phones or you know whatever, then they probably aren't, and you know, either yeah, shift the spotlight, and maybe, um, I know in in some games we ha- I I've had where um. Two of the players were really interested in following it, and the rest of them weren't. It was like, okay, tell you what, guys, how about we take this part, and we'll table it, and we'll take it offline, you know? So rather than play it out with everybody there, hey, you know, if you want to do this, you know, we can do it play by post, you know, we can, you know, take so, take up some of this stuff elsewhere. Or, you know, we're not taking spotlight time and other things away from other players, but you guys can still get that in, you know, if you, if you need a... If it's, you know, an NPC into PC, you know, and you want to do a play-by-post thing, it's like, you know, this is what's going on, you know, be sure, we can do that. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to do it at the table at the moment um, if, if not everybody is interested in it. Cool. So you're talking about reading body language, um, and I think that's that's really smart. Both both you and Liz have. Um if if somebody's like leaning back, is that is that a cue that you take, or is that really dependent on the person? Like, do you read the whole body? Do you look for facial expressions? What's most important to you, Nisha? Um, I tend to read the whole body because, like, I if if I'm listening, sometimes this because I play I do a lot of my gaming nowadays is um over Hangouts, so a lot of it you you don't get a lot the whole body, but you can kind of tell when somebody's paying attention, like, I tend to cock one ear towards it so I can hear a little better out of that ear. Um, and so, but that's just knowing my players, the players that I play with, this is, when they're interested, they're, this is how they're kind of acting. Um, versus this, you know, and, and we'll, we'll be, the chat window, you know, we'll be making suggestions about how the scene is going in the chat window, and you know, so, so you kind of, you can kind of gauge the feeling. Um, at a table table, um, again, it, it does kind of depend on the person. Like, some people lean back even while they're interested because, you know, they're paying attention. You know, it's like you're, you're having that popcorn moment and you just can't, you know, can't decide how it's going. Um, so it's it's a bit of knowing... If it's a regular game, it's a bit of knowing your players. If it's a con game, yeah, you're going to have to be more verbal. You're going to actually have to physically say, hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, check in, you know, if it's people that you haven't played with before. Oh, I have to, I, I'm I'm got a personal story. I'm talking about hang out in the chat window when in the in the Monster Hearts game the Kelly Vanderan a while back, that text window was like the greatest ever. It was like a side Twitter conversation. Uh, and there were people sending texts while in the middle there mm-hmm, were texting mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. they were into while they were having a conversation. Some, oh man. Guys, yeah, especially know. Monster Hearts is great for that. Is the chat window is great for Monster Hearts because um, you you know you're playing teenagers. What are you gonna do? Ninety percent of the time you're sending texts to each other. So yeah, you'll, <laughs> we'll be sitting, we'll be role playing, sitting in class and sending texts to the other you know other players' characters while you're doing it. You know, but that's what's for. It's use the tools you have. Absolutely. So before I get this too far off track, I apologize. Bill, uh, I just want to tap you real quick. Do you have any any suggestions for how to kind of check in and, and keep apprised of the the table that kind of the take their temperature? Yeah, sure. I mean, I um, uh, the thing that I that I wanted to, to chime in with was this idea that we don't we've already talked about making sure that that you go around the table uh, you know relatively quickly. Um, that you players take their turn and you know you. Sh- Share the spotlight time in, in a good way. So I think this question uh, that asks about oh you know making sure that's going in an entertaining, entertaining direction um, suggests something about okay you know uh, is it entertaining for the players who are involved in that in that plot line in that storyline and, and so um, you know so regardless of regardless of whether players at the table think um, it's a matter of okay is the player involved in that still invested in that storyline and and what's important there is to make sure that um, all of those choices. Um, are player driven, right? That that you're not forcing a player down a particular path or a particular line, but are in fact giving the players uh, choices and making those choices real, right? So you're not forcing a romance storyline on someone. Uh, you're in fact uh, providing an opportunity for it to happen and letting it happen. Um, uh, and if it if it 
it continues to be pursued, it's because the player wants to pursue it. And if the player veers off into a different direction, it's because the player wants to do that, right? So the notion that I'm imposing a plot line, I'm imposing a storyline as a GM on a player is something I need to check in to make sure that, oh, that player is entertained by my performance um, is, I think, exactly backwards, right? It's, it's I, you know, I'll throw out and I'll react to what you give me as a GM, um, but I'm not driving your play in any particular way. So I wanted to make sure that that, that, that was said. Do you have any tips for player-driven um, RPG like plots? How how do you try to help bring that out, or, or is it just something you just react to? Well, you know, I mean, it depends. It depends, of course, on the uh, game mechanics, right? I mean, how are characters constructed? Games like Fate and other uh, other games where you do a lot of um, uh, uh, narrative description of your character and your character's motivations, I think, allow that, right? So you know, you know what the character is driven by because they've written it down. Um, other games, that's harder, right? Um, uh, the notion that, um, but 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 ultimately, it's a matter of you know, um, uh, you know, in the traditional role-playing sense, right? You you present stimuli, you present as a GM, you present the world to to the players, and they react to it. And so, even in a, even in a game of Dungeon World, right? Even the most most uh, dungeon crawly game you can imagine, you put a princess in that game. Right, um, <laughs> and and again, I probably, I'm I'm going to run Thunderbolt tomorrow for some 14 year olds and their dads. Right, so I'm thinking along those terms. Right, so you you run, you put a you put a game, and you see what happens. Right, and um, it may be that one of those players, one of those 14 year olds, decides that, that oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rescue that princess, and she's going to love me. Right, and um, and so that's what I mean by player driven. Right, the the there's something in the world that the player can uh, 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 grab onto and um, react to and incorporate into their vision of who their character is. And that's, um, uh, uh, that means that you, you don't need to check in, right? Are you entertained by this? You, you see what's happening and you uh, just react to that. Um, and so you, you ask me, oh, is it purely reactive? Well, no, it's not purely reactive. Um, but it takes the tropes of the genre and presents them to the players and lets them react to those, and then you continue the cycle. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Uh, John, I'm going to lead off with you with a question from Sean P. Kelly. Uh, <laughs> how do you develop romance in an RPG? You make it a mechanic. And what I mean by that is... Uh, um, I always hear the, the, the phrase, you know... Romance, role-playing games, they're, they're not for rom- romance. is not a part of role-playing games. And I'm like, you've never played Pendragon, which is one of the oldest role-playing games in the book. Pendragon has rules, rules for romance. There's a whole chapter of rules for romance. And essentially what it means is that if you have a romance, if you're doing something for your romantic interest, you get to roll double dice. And I mean, you get to roll double dice. That's, that's really what it is. And when players find out about that, they want it. Right? They want it on their character sheet because they want to roll double dice. Right? Um, you know, Pendragon had it. Legend of Five Rings has it. Uh, Seventh Sea has it. House of the Blooded has it. Monster Hearts has it. These games have romance as a mechanic. It's on your character sheet. And if it's on your character sheet, we all know that means it's real. Because if it's not on your character sheet, then it's not real. But more importantly, um, the, the idea of... <laughs> The idea of, of how do you develop romance, I think a lot of these, I've been listening to a lot of the questions, and what a lot of the questions are, re, can re, you can really see what's behind them, which is, why is romance so much different than everything else in a role-playing game? And the answer is, it's not. Romance is just like killing people and taking their stuff. It's just like... Uh, killing people and traps. taking their hearts! Yeah, we're killing them and taking their hearts. Uh, it's just like casting spells... It's just like everything else in a role-playing game. Romance is part of storytelling. And none of us have any problem with, with romance in the stories that we read. But then when we start playing games that emulate the stories we read, oh, no, some, no, 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 we can't have romance now. And I think a lot of that boils down to the fact that there's a trope in, in gaming, which is you can't sit four white straight men from their tw- from their 20s to their 40s down and expect them to flirt with each other. 
And let me tell you, I have personal anecdotal experience that this is wrong. I ran a game that I'm going to be kickstarting later this year called Galaxy Triple X, which is Star Wars, except instead of the Force, it's the sex. And it's complete, it's complete sex all the time. And gender and orientation are, are traits in the game. They're, they're on your character sheet. <coughs> and I had four adult males, white males, in Austin, Texas, sit down and make a straight male character, a bisexual female character, a transgendered uh, pansexual character, and um, a character who we weren't really sure what its gender was. <coughs> and they all, like, every single line was a sexual innuendo. And there was sex all over the place, and they had a. And at the end of the game, I was like, "Did you guys have a good time?" They're like, "Oh my god, this was awesome! This was so much fun!" So anyone who tells me the thing about gamers don't want to sit down and flirt with each other, they're full of crap. Um, they will if you make romance a mechanic. If you give them bonus dice for falling in love. If you give them bonus dice for falling out of love, and all that other stuff. So that's really the core of that question is if you make romance just like everything else in the game, it will be like everything else in the game. Well, I've got, I've got a request here, John, that I have to ask. What is it about uh, in Houses of the Blooded, how did you make romance more awesome? Like, is there anything besides just pure mechanics and putting on the character sheet? Well, in, in Houses, Houses of the Blooded is a game about tragedy. Instead of, in most role-playing games, your character gets better. And in House of the Blooded, you start off really powerful and get worse, right? That's not really true, but that's that's good for the example. Instead of playing Conan, you're playing Elric, and that's that's the point. You have a tragic story about your character and who dies awfully at the end. And romance is a big part of it because that's the undoing of many characters. So when you start a romance with somebody, if 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 uh, Rich and I were to start a romance, um, we both have the romance on our character sheets, but they're not always at the same levels. My romance could be at four, and Rich's could be at two, and, and maybe the romance goes up for me, but goes down for him, or vice versa. And as long as you have the romance going, whenever you do things for your lover, you get that many more bonus dice. So again, more dice! More dice makes everybody happy. But then you can end the romance, and when you do, the other person, because there's, there's the French phrase, there's always the, the lever, the one who leaves and the one who is left. Right? So the one who is left, their romance, whatever rank the romance is, turns into revenge. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. And now I get bonus dice to screw with you until I get my satisfaction of hurting you uh, out of my system. So that's the whole romance and re revenge thing for Houses of the Blooded. Thank you, John. I appreciate You're welcome. that. Uh, I'm gonna, Liz... How how do you develop romance in RPG? I remember you've got a blog which we should totally link to where you talk about romance in RPG. It's a pretty amazing read. How do you develop it? Um, I think Misha hit on this um, that if you have players who are involved in a romance, um, I think it's always good if if someone actually you know wants to develop that relationship that uh, you give it some special attention. And you know, this is this is also um, like everybody has been saying actually. Um, you know, like everything that's kind of special for a character, you kind of focus on it. Um, I do with my players um, a lot of things like private sessions and um, play by post. Um, for example, that uh, my one friend that I had, we did a couple of private sessions together where she just was figuring out the relationship with this guy. Um, and I think that's important because your players then become a little bit more invested if they get more play time. Because obviously, you know, maybe you play um, for four or six hours every two weeks or so. And it, it's kind of hard um, from that perspective to really connect to an NPC just because you're doing so many other things as well. So if you have that time either via email or you have a time just to sit down and be like, hey, I want to I wanna talk to him about this. Like, why the hell did you storm out? Um, <laughs> then uh, then it, it makes things a little bit more real for your characters. Um, so yeah, I would, I would suggest that, you know, just be open if your players say like, hey, Liz, I, I really want to talk to him and say, okay, I don't, we don't have time for it in the session, but I can talk to you about it after, or we can talk to it, uh, talk about it by email, and that, that helps as well. And of course, all those extra dice, which is getting the wheels in my head turning. That sounds amazing. 
<laughs> John does that. Uh, all right, so we're about done with the panel. So if anybody else had the Romance and RP, I really feel like we covered it in a lot of the uh, CD and a lot of other questions. I would kind of um, kind of like to end it with one question, which I, I really like here. A uh, Wilhelm person asked, are there any games that are surprisingly suitable for playing romance stories? Uh, by now, hopefully everybody here has heard of Emily Care Boss's romance trilogy, Breaking the Ice, uh, Shooting the Moon, and Under My Skin. Um, and then there's the D20 Blue Rose game as well, and uh, Daughters of Verona, uh, which was written more or less about on a checklist of romantic mm. comedy tropes. And then, Bill, you know, if you want to lead it off to talk a little bit more about your, your fake core game, and then everybody, if we could just get a suggestion from you about a game that you think is pretty awesome for romance and, and RPG. So, Bill, tell us a little bit more about that game. You said it's uh, English... What, how, we... Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, I describe it as uh, uh, Downton Abbey meets The Last Exile with um, on a collision course uh, with Doctor Zhivago. Right? It's it's the idea is that um, there's a sort of a steampunk vibe, but uh, there's also uh, uh, it focuses on romance and political intrigue in a Europe that never was, with characters who are passengers, crew, and uh, servants aboard um, a, a posh sky salon. Uh, in the skies of Europe, in sort of an anti uh, anti Bella period, uh, and so as they're cruising across the skies of Europe, things are falling apart below them. And so I've run it a couple of times, um, and uh, you know because the way the weights the way that it produces romance, I think is that or romance is one of the potential conflicts that it can produce is that every character has a a desire aspect that is a thing that they want which can be of course someone you know they can want someone and every other every character also has a refusal aspect which is the reason why they won't just give in to thing, people who want things to them right or from them and so um, so that creates this um, uh, this interesting pattern of desire and rejection or refusal or at least uh, delay that um, that means that um, what happens is characters are always pursuing other characters who are always fleeing, and that is um, that turns out to be a lot of fun. And uh, and the fact that it's um, that there are armored biplanes and um, floating sky salons just makes it all all the better, I think. Nice, nice. Uh, uh, so, um, Misha, what about you? What, what's a romance RPG that you would recommend? Monster Hearts, hands down. Um, I mean, you're 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 playing teenagers who are going through high school at or or not teenagers. I mean, we've played um, Joe uh, Joe Beeson made a um, a hack called Elder Hearts where they're um, the same character of classes, but in a retirement community, which you know also just is like. Of course. Why wouldn't you have? You would totally have these people in a in a retirement community. Um, we've we've done them um, in college, you know. But anytime you you know you throw a bunch of of, of similar age characters in a room that are at you know the peaks of or hormone spikes, you're gonna have some romances. And and um, a lot of the Monster Hearts playbooks are are pretty much setting up romances between you know like the mortal and 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 whoever their lover is and and uh, the neighbor and and and. Um, uh, I mean, it, the, the game has sex moves, and and turn me on is a basic move, and um, and it, it's it's just kind of geared for if not X, which isn't always the same thing, but sometimes is a pretty good approximation. Sometimes. That's great, thank you, Misha. Liz, what about you? Any romance RPG you'd like to recommend? Misha, you took my monster heart. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> actually, um, I, I would uh, I would dare to say any pretty dark horror type of, um, of role play games like Call of Cthulhu and um, Vampire the Masquerade and things like that. Um, just simply because um, in those games you kind of get to explore that aching romance. You know, the kind of romance that you watch in television, the kind of romance that you don't want to watch because it's a train wreck, but you, you have to keep watching, um, which is normally very different than your normal life. And uh, it's just, it builds that excitement. And if you set it on this kind of romantic, dark background, 
um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a lovely thing, and it's something that's, uh, that's really fun. And also, I think, can sometimes give your character a bit of hope in an otherwise really horrible setting, <laughs> uh, like plot-wise, not, not actual story-wise. <laughs> Call of Cthulhu is a horrible setting. Is that is that what I'm missing? No, it's, 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 oh, no, no, I love it. You said it. Okay, and John, we will end off with you. Oh, it looks like he's even got a book. John, uh, could you? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he wants to fondle his Call of Cthulhu. This is it's, the first role-playing game I ever bought. Right here, from Spencer's Gifts for ten dollars. It was normally thirty. Looks yeah, like there's no gag gifts at Spencer's. Cthulhu has tentacles, and I hear women are really into that. But no. <laughs> this game! This game! Um, uh, there's a, among professional grognard game designers like us, um, there's a phrase called the Stafford Rule, which is if you think you've thought of a clever mechanic, uh, Greg Stafford probably came up with it 20 years ago. Um, uh, Pendragon is the game that that it, it's perfect it, it's the perfect game it, 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 it emulates Arthurian literature without flaw and one element of Arthurian li literature is romance and the way that it does it is so evocative and and so robust that um, and, and not only that but uh, spends about 30 pages talking about romance talking about the, 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 the very beginnings of romantic love and how it transformed our culture and, and all this other stuff because Greg is an Arthur scholar nut. So he can, you know, pontificate on that for a great deal of time. But, um, uh, yeah, Pendragon, the, the, the romance mechanic for it is beautiful and sublime and simple and perfect. And I completely stole it for, uh, for <laughs> at least half of my games. But, uh, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Thank you, John. All right. Well, we have come up on time. Thank you to all four of my fantastic panelists. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who asked questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. Evidently, romance takes a while. Who knew? Uh, so, hey, 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 you can hey, find hey. her on... Oh, most role-playing games, role games, you take five hours to resolve the ten-second fight, <laughs> but seducing the barmaid is 1d20 roll. Obviously, games written by virgins. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, so Bill had mentioned Romance in the Air. His game is uh, a fake game. It sounds like it's really interesting for people who are watching this panel. Um, John has a number of games. John Wick Presents is the best place to find his stuff. Liz's game, Witch. I don't think Witches are very romantic, but I think she's got a lot of great ideas, and there she may have slipped it in. Uh, so Liz's it's a dark is coming setting. Out. That's right. It's a dark setting, which is it's perfect for romance. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> it's just ripped away from you. <laughs> as soon as doomed that, romance, but romance. We will, we will have that linked in the in the YouTube show notes as soon as it goes live, so you can go check it out. And uh, and thank you all. A special thanks to Jug Carlman, who was uh, kind of my production assistant here. He helped me to tease out some of the questions from the amazing answers that we got here from everybody. Thanks, Judd. We really appreciate that. We love you, Judd. And so uh, please do. If you like this episode, if you like panels from Indie Plus or all these cool people, go ahead and subscribe to Indie Plus. I'm going to point up... And then you choose to the side where you see Indie Plus. You click on that. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we're always looking for more subscribers, more feedback. <coughs> so thank you very much for your uh, attendance panelists and for your watching. And everybody have an excellent evening.